Tonight we commemorate the Buddha's cremation, seven days after Wisaka Bhusha. The story goes that the, the Malans, after learning the Buddha's passing away, decided they were going to cremate the body the very first day. But they spent their time in setting up pavilions, arranging for music, dance, and honor the Buddha. They went on until, until late in the afternoon, so they figured, well, we'll do it, but cremate the body the next day. Well, the next day they had more music and more dance, again, until late in the afternoon. This kept up until finally, the beginning of the seventh day, they decided they would cremate the body. They had their plans for how to do it, but the Davis had other plans. Originally, they were going to take the, the body out to the south of the city and cremate it there, but when they tried to lift it up, they couldn't lift it up. So they consulted with Venerable Anuruddha. He said, well, the Davis want you to take him out the east side of the city. So they went out the east side of the city. And they were about to set fire to the pyre, but it wouldn't light. And again, Anuruddha said that the Davis are waiting. Mahakasapa is coming. Finally, Magahasapa showed up with a large entourage, paid respect to the Buddha, and then the pyre lit spontaneously. And when the fire died down, there was nothing left but the relics, which had been scattered all over the world. We even have some relics here, we're told. What's interesting about these places that are associated with the Buddha is that the Buddha himself said they were places for giving rise to a sense of basada, or confidence. Yet in the commentaries and in popular language in Thailand and all over Southeast Asia, they're called places for giving rise to Sangweka. I think part of the, the reason for that is that the Buddha took the Sangweka out of Sangweka. In other words, Sangwega originally meant terror. It was the feeling he felt when he was young. He realized that he too was subject to aging, illness, and death. He'd probably known it, but it didn't really hit home until one point when he realized that all of the happiness he would search for, if it too was subject to aging, illness, and death, would leave him with nothing. He felt a strong sense of terror how meaningless everything was, pointless everything was. As he said, he saw the world as a small body of water drying up, and the fishes were fighting one another over the last remaining water. It didn't matter who won, because they were all going to die. And everywhere he looked in the world, anywhere he looked, where he might want to lay claim to something on which to base his happiness. Someone had already laid claim to it. So if he was going to try for a happiness in the world, he'd have to fight other people. That was his terror. But then he said that the problem came from an arrow buried in the heart, and it was possible to remove the arrow. The arrow, of course, here is the suffering caused by craving. Once the arrow is removed, then there's no more suffering. The story that built up around the Buddha's leaving home would have it that he had never seen any old people or ill people or dead people before. He was well into his twenties. Then one day he went out and rode around the city and he saw them for the first time, felt that strong sense of Sangwega. And then he saw a forest mendicant. And in this version of the story, he told himself, if there's a way out, that's the way out. The feeling he felt then, that there's a way out, was basada. Confidence. And it's through his practice, as he did go out into the forest, first looking for teachers who would teach him the way to the deathless, finding that nobody at that time knew anything about it, realizing he was going to find it on his own. He still had the confidence that there must be a way out. 
then it must be attainable through human effort. And there's a paradox there. If something is free from suffering, it has to be unconditioned. And so how could human effort, which is composed of conditions, create that? You realize you couldn't create it, but it just might lead there. And that's what he found. He was able to fabricate a path of practice, the Eightfold Path, that led to the threshold of the deathless. And then abandoning the path, he was able to enter into the deathless. And so what he realized is that sense of the world closing in, of every opportunity for happiness already being laid claim to, the terror that he felt, the dismay. He was able to shatter. He was able to show others that they didn't have to have terror or dismay over that, because there was a way out. And as a result, Sangwega began to change. You see this even in the, in the canon itself. The later additions to the canon describe Sangwega as a rapturous feeling probably because by that time it had become so closely associated with Basada. The Buddha had shown through his own practice and his teachings that it was possible to find a true happiness that didn't require fighting other people off. A happiness that was not going to end in death. And all the many people who followed him and found that it was true became witnesses to that truth. So whatever Sangwega they had felt before was now thoroughly replaced with Basada. So the associations with the word changed. And the Apadanas, which are probably the very last part of the canon, they talk about people who've made a gift to the Sangha made a gift to the Buddha, and as a result of that, and this we're talking about gifts many aeons ago, they forecast that they would have become arahants in this lifetime here, under the Gautam, under Gautama the Buddha, and talks about their course through the through many, many lifetimes, as kings, as queens, universal monarchs. And then finally, when they've had enough of all the fun that the world can provide, they let it go. They said it with a sense of rapture and sangwega. In other words, this is sangwega that knows that there's a way out, that's confident there's a way out. It's not the sangwega the Buddha felt when he was young, where it seemed like everything was closed. This is a Sangwega that's had all the doors open. And so no wonder it, there's a sense of rapture, that regardless of what the affairs of the world have been, what your life has been, there's something better. There's a way out. You're not trapped. This is the message of the Buddha's life, the message of his passing away. He passed away totally peacefully. It inspired song and dance for seven days. And left behind a large following of people who had found the same freedom, the same purity that he had found. They had found the open doors. And so they've kept that message alive ever since. So even though they talk about the the people at the time feeling a lot of grief around the Buddha's passing. There were also the Arahants. They said, well, what can you expect? That's the nature of co compounded things. They're going to pass away. And they could meet his, even his death, the death of their teacher who had found the way and shown it to him. They could meet that with peace. Years back, a Vipassana teacher was studying with a John Sawat and asked him about his feelings when his teacher, John Fun, had passed away. And John Sweat said when he was young, 
first starting with a John Fund, sometimes the thought would come to him, what, what can I do, what will I do if, if anything happens to John Fun? I'll be totally lost. But by the time a John Fun did pass away, he was much more solid in his practice, and he was able to view a John Fun's death with equanimity. This is the nature of things, to arise and pass away. It was the Buddha's ability to ability to train his students in that same solidity of mind. That's what took the terror out of terror. It turned Sangwega from something that was suffering from a sense of closed-in meaninglessness into something where the, the doors are wide open. That's the Buddha's accomplishment, and the doors are still open now. That image of the open door, it comes in the canon. The doors are open to the deathless. They're open when a Buddha opens them. We have to make sure, though, that in our own practice we don't close the door. We have to have confidence in our ability. It's not that the people back in those days were huge superhuman. They had many of the same foibles, sometimes worse problems than we do. But they were able to do this, able to do the practice, to get through that open door. They can do it, we can do it. This is why we commemorate events like this. It's to try to collapse the sense of time. So that awakening is not something that's far away. The path is right here. That's what the Buddha taught from the very beginning of his teaching career to the very end. The first thing he taught was the Eightfold Path. The last thing he taught was the Noble Eightfold Path. That path is still here. It leads to an open door. So we should have a sense of confidence. And it is possible in general, and it is possible for us in particular. This part of the Buddha's teachings is timeless. The truths he found are as true then as they are now, and they are the same truths. It's up to us now to be true. To be honest, accountable, earnest in our practice. Take advantage of the open door while it's still open. <laughs>